Thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, in the last couple of years in my writing, I've been looking at this idea that I've come to think of as the negative path to happiness and success. <laughs> the idea that there might actually be enormous power and potential in turning towards all those messy emotions and situations that we usually spend our lives running very hard to avoid. Failure, uncertainty, insecurity, vulnerability, mortality, uh, pessimism. Obviously, mainly just because I'm a pessimistic British grouchy person, and, and I wanted to, uh, you know, monetize that. <laughs> but, um, but also, more sincerely, because I think we've swung far too far in the direction as a culture in, in America, but also in, the, in Europe. Uh, in the direction of a sort of relentless positivity that actually turns out to be a big barrier to uh, getting the most creative stuff done. So when I was just beginning to get a handle on this whole uh, world, uh, I, I, um, I did what any newspaper reporter would do, I guess. I went to the, to the epicenter of the culture of positive thinking. I went to um, a thing in... Uh, <laughs> a big motivational seminar in Texas called... called Get motivated, exclamation point. <laughs> and um, this is kind of extraordinary. There's thousands and thousands of people in a basketball stadium, uh, fireworks from the stage, uh, kind of motivational music, and you have to, you're, you're instructed to jump up and show how motivated you are every, uh, every few minutes, which is a bad scene for a British person like me. <laughs> um, it's kind of amazing. The keynote speaker the day I went was, was uh, George W. Bush who was doing a lot of, um, at that time, he was doing a lot of these post-presidential sort of motivational speeches. He's since kind of pivoted into the uh, dog painting uh, <laughs> area. But anyway, we were, t we were told over and over again that day from the stage, all the way through by him and by everyone else, essentially the same message, which is that the only way to succeed is to refuse to countenance the possibility of things going wrong, to think only certain thoughts, to feel only certain emotions, uh, and, to, and to rule out the possibility of failure. One of the speakers, a guy called Robert Schuler, who's a veteran self-help author and also um, the pastor of a megachurch in, in California, told us that uh, he actually said we should eliminate the word impossible from our vocabularies. Um, so, you know, you can imagine my surprise when I learned a few months later that Robert Schuler's megachurch had uh, filed for bankruptcy. The, the uncharitable thought occurred that, that maybe that was a word he'd forgotten to eliminate from, from his uh, vocabulary. And then a few months after that, a, a bit more than a year, I think, the Get Motivated seminar series itself collapsed um, uh, amid all sorts of um, lawsuits alleging that there were um, unpaid bills and a, and a very bitter falling out between the, uh, the, the couple who, who, who ran it. I don't bring this up to sneer at their failure. Part of what I find myself saying all the time is that the, there is no shame, there should be no shame in the failure. But I did at that point start to think that, you know, if, if the people whose job it is to promote these guaranteed paths to success can't make a success of promoting them uh, as guaranteed paths to success, then, then something, something is uh, amiss. I'm well aware that this is a kind of an easy target, and I suppose most people in this room need telling that uh, that kind of positive thinking uh, has uh, a lot of limitations. You're probably aware of the um, study that says that um, self-help affirmations, you know, the phrases you're supposed to repeat to yourself, they can make people feel worse. There was a study where um, they asked people to repeat the phrase, I am a lovable person to themselves. <laughs> and if you have low self-esteem going into that exercise, you end up feeling worse, as if you hadn't than if you'd not said it to begin with, because it sort of prompts people to come up with counter-arguments about how they aren't uh, really that lovable. We know as well from some research that in certain contexts, visualizing your, the out, successful outcome of what you're, what you're trying to achieve can make you less likely to achieve it. There's a lot of stuff uh, like this around uh, at the moment. But I wanted to focus today on one very specific part of that, positivity culture, that, that uh, cult of optimism, as it's been called, because I think it's much more pernicious, but precisely because I think smart, intelligent, skeptical people, which I take all of us here to be, um, are more likely to fall into its trap. And as, uh, and as Scott mentioned, that's the, that's the idea of 
uh, this fixation on goal setting, the idea that it's always better to have a clearer, more specific goal, to put more effort into trying to achieve it, to focus uh, as much as possible on uh, reaching that endpoint. I think actually this can be a real major barrier to achieving the most interesting things. So in the time I have left, I just first of all want to tell a short, very brief story that I think illustrates that um, very vividly, the psychological mechanism that's uh, in play there, and then uh, finish off by looking at the alternative, which to me is the idea of learning to thrive in and on uncertainty, finding ways to uh, take a step forward do things that are constructive, take constructive action, even when you don't actually know exactly which way forward necessarily is or, or where you're headed. So um, the story is actually a pretty grim and horrifying one, and it concerns what happened on uh, Mount Everest in 1996. I apologize that this slide looks a bit like it's an inspirational poster about the importance of <laughs> goal setting. Put that, put that, from, <laughs> put that from your minds. Um, seriously, this is, this is not, um, this is uh, a, a pretty awful tale. You'll know it already, actually, if you've read John Krakauer's book, uh, Into Thin Air. You'll know the basics of, of, of what happened, um, especially resonant, actually, in, in, in light of uh, recent events there. In 1996, eight climbers died in one 24-hour uh, period, and 15 climbers died uh, during that summer's climbing season. What makes this not just a, a tragedy but a mystery as well is that it has always been very, very hard to explain what it was that, that went wrong. Uh, if you don't know, in outline what happened is that at a place called the Hillary Step, uh, very, very, very close to the summit, just a few uh, hundred feet, uh, there, was a, there was a traffic jam essentially. A whole, group of different, whole set of different groups of climbers became uh, bottlenecked. And, uh, Instead of turning back when they reach the time at which safety demands that they do turn back so that they don't end up descending in, uh, in darkness and in the worst of uh, Everest weather, these climbers, many of them very experienced and professional, pushed on uh, and on, many of them reaching the summit hours uh, after the scheduled time and then becoming uh, lost and disoriented, coming to grief later when they were descending. Nobody's ever really been able to explain exactly why they did that. Um, but it turns out that by a coincidence, there was a guy in the foothills of the Himalayas at the time this was happening, who at first glance, I don't think you would imagine would have anything uh, useful to say. He was a burned out stockbroker. His name was uh, Christopher Kays. He was on a hiking vacation in the foothills of the Himalayas. He'd gone there just to get some, some, uh, some rest and restoration. But it ended up haunting him, you know, the fact that he was there. He's since become an organizational psychologist. He encountered, at the time, members of the, of the rescue parties, and he told me that it haunted him as if it had happened to a member of his own family, because it really reminded him, in terms of the basic psychological pattern that he saw as he spent several months and, indeed, years after that trying to investigate what had happened, it reminded him of something that he'd seen over and over again in a totally different context in the corporate world, where chief executive would announce some very ambitious goal, get everybody extremely excited about it, use it to pump up morale in the organization as everybody got more and more focused on this, uh, on this outcome. And then information would start to creep in that maybe it was an unwise goal, maybe it was going to have some really serious negative consequences uh, for the organization. And that would make everyone feel very anxious and insecure and uncertain, as you'd expect. But this is the interesting part. They would be so allergic to feeling that uncertainty, so unwilling to, to entertain those emotions, that they would commit even harder to the goal. And that is when things would go uh, really wrong. And, and Kays makes a really persuasive case that what happened in 1996 on Everest was that the goal of reaching the summit had become part of the climber's identity. It was no longer just a, a really big project outside them that they wanted to achieve, if at all possible. It was their main source of social identity. And so the idea that that much uncertainty could be associated with something so fundamental was, was unacceptable on a sort of subliminal level and led to this overcommitment to the goal. 
Um, it turns out that there are studies among mountaineers, indeed among mountaineers climbing Everest from 1963, that demonstrated exactly this uh, pattern. This is, um, this is Chris Case's uh, Chris summary of that study. The more uncertain climbers felt about their possible success in reaching the summit, the more likely they were to invest in their particular strategy. And he calls the Everest disaster of 96 one of the most compelling examples of how goal setting can lead organizations down the wrong path. Mountaineers, of course, don't talk in these terms of uh, social identity theory and, and all the psychological jargon. They talk about um, summit fever. And, uh, and here, uh, it's come through a little... There is, there is um, uh, the American climber Ed Viestas, who, who watched this traffic jam from lower down Everest on the day through a telescope. And he says... In the back of your mind, you're telling yourself, we should turn around because we're late, we're going to run out of oxygen. But you see the summit and it draws you there. It's so magnetic that people tend to break their rules and they go to the summit. And on a good day, you'll get away with it. And on a bad day, you'll die. For me, I think what that story illustrates and what the studies that are associated with it illustrate are that a lot of the time when we are being very, very driven by very specific goals, we're not doing something as virtuous as we think. We're actually in flight from uncertainty. We're actually trying to find a way to feel like we know how the future is going to unfold, to, to exert control over something inherently uncontrollable. Sometimes that may lead to very, very cautious behavior, but as you see from here, it can sometimes lead to the exact opposite. It's not the only downside of what's been called the over-pursuit of goals. I'll just run very quickly through a few of the others. Uh, there's some fascinating evidence that the over-pursuit of goals uh, encourages cheating. A little bit of credit first for the title of Lisa Ordonez and her colleagues study, Goals Gone Wild. It's a, <laughs> it's a bad pun, but an interesting study. She and her colleagues um, gave people word games to do and told some of them uh, to meet a certain target and self-report their progress and told others to just do your best. And the people given a target were much, much more likely to lie about uh, how far they got. There's even some evidence that over-pursuit of goals uh, inhibits performance. Uh, people do less well uh, in the context of, of, of goals under certain conditions. The study I mentioned there is about what happens to um, taxis and taxi drivers in New York when it rains, something that some of you who came in yesterday may have uh, experienced directly. On rainy days in, in New York, uh, it's not just that the demand for cabs increases, but the supply diminishes too, because taxi drivers go home sooner, in the, earlier in the day, uh, because they've already met their self-imposed income goal for the day, because they meet it faster. So you get this very sort of ironic and irrational outcome where they miss out on some of the easiest income they could earn, and the people who would like to get a cab are getting drenched on a street corner trying to install uh, Uber for the first time into their, <laughs> into their uh, smartphones um, because, of, because of goals that, that have been set. There's also uh, lots and lots of evidence, uh, uh, a slightly more conventional critique of goal setting, that it triggers unintended consequences for an organization, for a person. The classic example uh, the person who says they're going to be a, a multimillionaire by the age of 30. And they succeed in that goal, but at the cost of destroying their health, destroying their happiness, alienating all their friends and family. It's a question of failing to define uh, accurately what success uh, would look like. I'm certainly not suggesting that uh, you abandon all your goals, because I don't think it's wise, and you wouldn't listen to me anyway if I, if I, if I did say it. But I think there's a real benefit to trying to find ways to loosen our grip on, on those goals as, as goal-driven people. Uh, because when you look at what successful entrepreneurs really do, and this may resonate with many experiences in the room, you, don't, you find that they don't uh, follow this uh, stereotype, this idea that they have a shining vision of where they're headed, a very clear idea, and then they stubbornly try to bend reality to, to turn into, to, to, to make the vision real. What they do, as uh, is revealed by some fascinating studies by uh, Saras Sarasvathy, who's a researcher at UVA. She sat with many uh, entrepreneurs who'd been repeatedly successful over years and found that, you know, they made business plans when they really had to for someone else. But that wasn't 
what they wanted to do. They didn't do extensive market research. They tried to make a sale so they would get some uh, immediate feedback. They, um, they didn't uh, focus on trying to bring one vision into reality. They were ready to move, to adapt, to use whatever means and ideas were at their disposal uh, to change the definition of where they were heading at any moment. It's almost a spiritual point, I think, if you'll pardon that word. You know, the idea that, the idea that uncertainty and life are very closely connected somehow, and there is something about knowing exactly how everything's going to turn out uh, that is a kind of death. I think that um, uh, Sarasvati's entrepreneurs certainly uh, had, had uh, internalized this message that the great psychoanalyst Eric Fromm, uh, in the slightly sexist language of his day, uh, as he put it, uncertainty is the very condition to impel man to unfold his powers. Or as she puts it in her study, seasoned entrepreneurs know that surprises are not deviations from the path. Instead, they're the norm, the flora and fauna of the landscape from which one learns to forge a path through the jungle. So, okay, that's the big point. I think the question, obviously, is then how does one do this? How do you, how do you uh, put this into practice in, in, in the in the day-to-day. -day. Uh, one piece of uh, great advice from Sarasvati, which has really helped me anyway, is uh, what she calls the principle of affordable loss. Don't ask, how sure am I that something I'm hoping to do is going to succeed? Instead, ask, could I tolerate the costs if it was a spectacular failure? If the answer is, yes, you could, then that should be all you need to know to take action. Uh, another one of hers the principle of the bird in hand. Don't ask what would be the best thing to create, or don't only ask that, but also ask what could be made from the materials, the resources, the ideas, the people that are, that are facing me right now. The analogy that I really like for this uh, that, that uh, one writer used was the idea that these successful creative entrepreneurs are not like gourmet chefs who visualize an amazing... Uh, perfect dish and then uh, spend months sourcing the ingredients from around the world. They're much more like, uh, well, I was going to say you or I, I should say, they're much more like me, uh, coming home at the end of the day, opening the cupboards, opening the fridge, seeing what scraps are there, um, and throwing something together that might be a bit dubious at first, and you might have to change the definition of what it is that you're making as you, as you, as you go. If you do want to set a goal, at least make sure there's a process goal in there somewhere. These are the goals like you're going to work on, you're going to write 500 words of your novel each morning before you go to work. You're going to have four hours of time per week for your entire organization for deep, uh, focused concentration. Uh, you're going to have 10 ideas for new products a week. You know, not good ideas, not 500 words of the next Pulitzer Prize winning novel, not deep focused concentration time that's going to lead to something specific, but just uh, focusing on the process. My favorite example of this is uh, Anthony Trollope, the novelist who worked for three hours a day every morning before he went to his office job writing not his novel, his novels. If he finished a novel in the middle of one three hour period, he just went on to the next one. <laughs> An extraordinary commitment to the process rather than uh, the outcome. And then finally, if you need a self-help slogan to sort of counter all those self-help slogans from Get Motivated, this made so much difference to me uh, as a writer, the idea that you do not have to feel like doing something in order to do it. Such a liberating insight. <laughs> all those motivational messages like uh, the ones you hear at Get Motivated! Exclamation um, point. It seems like they would help you get things done, but they actually, I think... Uh, erect this additional barrier. They say now you've not only got to do the challenging, important thing, but you've got to feel like doing it as well. And I think that is a lot of a bigger demand, and it's an unnecessary demand, because you can simply feel the unwilling emotions. You can let them be there, and at the same time, you can take a physical action. You can open the laptop. You can open a file. If you're a writer, you, know, you can write 100 words. You don't need to be feeling all the time like doing it. Uh, I think this is an example of what the poet John Keats was talking about when he used this 
now famous phrase, negative capability. The idea that we need to find ways to be able to coexist with these emotions, with these negative uh, feelings. We don't always need to be able, having to try to stamp them out to be absolutely certain about what, where we're going to be feeling good uh, about where we're headed. I think that those capabilities are just as important as the, uh, 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 as the more positive ones. Just in closing, sometimes when I talk about this stuff, and you may be thinking about this, there's something comes up called the Yale Study of Goals. Uh, it's very, very famous. It's in every single book about a self-help book about goal setting you ever come across. The story goes that in 1953, researchers asked the graduating class of Yale University how many of them had specific written down goals for their future. Only 3% said that they did. 20 years later, the researchers caught up with those same former students, found that the 3% who'd set goals uh, had amassed more financial wealth than the other 97% combined. It's an amazing finding. Turns out there's just one methodological flaw with the study, uh, which is that it's completely made up. <laughs> uh, it didn't happen. There was a journalist a few years ago who went to one of the self-help gurus who recommended it, and he said, oh, you should ask the other guy, and, and that guy said, you should ask the other guy, and it went round in a perfect circle. And I followed it up, too, with Yale and some other places. It's a myth didn't happen. I think a lot of the things that we think and that we think we know about goal setting and the fixation on goals are a myth. And that if we can find ways to put one foot in front of the other without necessarily knowing where we're going, we'll actually end up in some far more interesting, thrilling, and meaningful places. Thank you very much. Thank you.